don't want to leave this meeting. Um, so my, I cannot communicate to the central library because my screen is filled with my lecture. Okay, tell us what longer. you want us to tell them. Um, tell them I can't see anything other than my lecture screen, so I don't know when I can start. Uh, okay, hold on. I'm going to try to, um, I mean, other people could do it as well. I'm just going to try to. Yeah, but he just called me while I was in my car, and I'm hopeful that he can, no. Well, just a moment, I'll be right back. I'm going to escape from here so that I can at least see back to what I want. So give me just a moment more, because does anybody know if everybody has been let into the room? Does anybody know? Can anybody tell me? There's only eight people so far. How many people signed up? Do you know? I don't know. I didn't hear that. Let's see if I can ask. Um... The Central Library. Yeah, his name is Don, D-O-N. I'll be right back. Let me... I apologize all, I'm having technical difficulties at this end and I will be with you mo very shortly. The materials that I had in my hands at school, I think I left on my desk. So I'm just printing the last couple pages so I have everything to talk to you about and I apologize. Well, we've got a good night coming up so that will should be good. I sent a message to Don. I haven't seen an, an answer yet. Okay, thank you very much. Take your time. It'll be fine. Yeah, I know. I'm just just breathe. <laughs> yeah, I know. Breathe. <laughs> I'm breathe. Yeah. yeah, I hear you. But between the PGA parking on the MCC campus, that everybody feels they're entitled to park wherever they want, and students can't get on campus or can't find parking spots. Add that to the confusion of the last week of school and oh my God, everybody's going nuts. So I'll be right back.
Well, I guess she's gone, but I was able to connect in from another device and it let me in. It put me in the waiting room for a second and then it let me in. Oh, good. I think they're letting people in. I just don't think that he can speak, but I think he's able to. I'm oh, sorry, yeah. I was away. Yeah, so I, I connected from another device and I, I was in the waiting room for like a second and then they let me in. So they're letting people in. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, all right. Thank you, Don, for the note. I see it in the chat. Um, I am going to go back to presenting mode. Let's see if I can get the chat down. Okay, can... Okay, I'm trying to share this. But we see a screen that says female artists. So do you see female artists who change the world? Yes, without okay. the eye panels. Can, can everybody, do you know? Anybody, can anybody tell me? I mean, I can't tell you what other we, people can see. <laughs> well, uh, I see it perfectly fine from the okay. Well, let's I can assume. see it as well. Okay. Let me assume that everybody is here and that it's projecting. And I hope, Don, you've hit the press, press the record button so that I will move forward here. It is recording. It's Great. Like that one I connected. Thank you very much. All right. Good evening. I apologize for this mix up and this last minute stuff, but I'll tell you, I just flew from MCC home to uh, Bushnell's Basin. So, I want to talk to you about tonight's uh, topic. I am looking at female artists who I think change the world. And I can honestly tell you that there are so many out there and picking 10 to talk about in a little over an hour's time was really tough. But I am Marjorie Crum. I am a professor of design at Monroe Community College. And tonight's presentation is going to look at some what I think are significant women artists and illustrators, including Beatrix Potter, Christine Monroe, Joelle Dubois, and Mary Cassatt, among many others. So let me get us into this presentation. So um, what I can tell you, oh, that didn't work. Okay, so let's see if that worked. No. Nope. All right, nothing is moving forward. Okay, why? Okay, I guess I'll do it that way. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Okay, let's see if this works now. Nope. Okay, let me see if I can do this one at a time. Okay, so let me start with uh, the women we're going to, to begin with. Uh, I have kind of broken this up into uh, 19th, 20th and 21st century women because I would love to talk about the old uh, people because they're the ones most familiar to me. Um, I can tell you though, that each of these uh, women that I investigated and looked at for this whole thing are really cool. And I really like their things. And many of these women have work that's in shows that often they were marginalized and their work is now being better recognized and showcased, including women who painted right alongside of the men that are the ones that everybody knows about. So the women of this lecture all contributed to their era in the variety of ways. So let me show you how these women of the 19th, 20th and 21st centuries, how they rolled. Oh, sorry. So the 19th century, these are some of the uh, big things that happened during the 19th century. So the American Civil War was an historic event that forever changed the way Americans look at uh, their culture. Uh, it did divide the culture and it divided a number of things in terms of everything that came before the war and everything that came after the war. So there's a lot of before the Civil War and after the Civil War in a lot of the way they report things in the 19th century. 
So um, the second industrial revolution occurred in 1865 to the 1900 period. And this redefined the American way of life, but also life around the world. Inventions like you see here relied on electricity, steel and petroleum, and their use spurred the growth of rail rail railways, excuse me, steamships, and they all helped to transform everything from farming into manufacturing kind of environment. The 19th century was the age of machine tools that made other tools. So machines making other machine parts for other machines, including interchangeable parts. This era brings about the assembly line. It also speeds up the factory production of goods. And it also gives birth to the notion of a professional scientist. Science uh, organizations in Europe were very heavily men focused. The fact that the word scientist itself was first used in 1833 shows here some of the inventions that were invented in that late part of the 19th century. They included the telegraph, the typewriter, and the telephone, which all led to faster and wider means of communication. So the first woman that we're going to look at is certainly Mary Cassatt. Cassatt is one of those women that really is well known, felt fairly well known, and most people think of Mary Cassatt as the woman who painted babies and children and mothers. And they, she did do that, but she was the only American artist that was invited to exhibit with the French Impressionists back in the uh, late 1800s. She was a woman ahead of her time. She rebelled against the patriarchal norms that tried to ban her from studying art and studying in the arts. She also enjoyed the same benefits as her male artist peers because she was not afraid to stand up for herself and put herself in the front of the world. She enrolled at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts despite her father's wishes. Didn't think she needed to go to school. And when she found their methods at the school too slow and patronizing, she flees to Paris to seek education from private tutors. Much like her impressionistic friends, Cassatt painted women and children in their quiet, intimate moments. But under the guidance of her close friend and Edgar Degas, Cassatt experimented with different materials and mediums. She became quite proficient in pastels, and later on her style evolved from a typical impressionistic brush strokes to flat and monochromatic color tones inspired by the Japanese art called Yukioe. So alongside this undeniable talent, her painting and her print skills, Cassatt was also an outspoken feminist who did not let herself be dismissed by men. Mary Cassatt never married, and she was well aware that if she married or when she married, she would have to sacrifice her own artistic career should she marry. So she didn't. She took part in recreating what it meant to be a new woman in the 19th century, taking cues from her mother who had principled and social was principled and socially active. So she had the connections to get you where you needed to be. Uh, even when she could no longer create art, Cassatt, because, because of her deteriorating eyesight, she continued to support women's suffrage as the movement. And throughout her life, she advocated for women's rights and represented them in her artworks with a sense of dignity and depth that male artists could not convey. Yeah. So the next artist we're going to look at should be familiar to many of you. Beatrix Potter. Now, Beatrix Potter, Potter is one of the most beloved and influential storytellers of all time. We all know her from the tale of Peter Rabbit. And, you know, it was kind of funny to see these rabbits taking on human imaginations and through their fantastical exploits, they were able, she was able to bring nature and nature studies to children. And when the women had no right to vote, she decided well, that's not right. There was no virtually no access to higher education. Very rarely did women own property, and they were themselves considered property of their husbands. 
Potter did not like this. She became a commercial success and she would became commercially successful as a writer and an artist using the royalties from her books to purchase her famed Hilltop Farm. And while she's there, she lived simply and had a great love for the land. And you can start to see it in the things that she is drawing for the children. But some of the items you see here on here are the beautiful studies of mushrooms that she did. She was a mycologist and she really liked looking at the flora and the fauna in the woods and spent a lot of times there. Because the pervasive Victorian enthusiasm for natural history produced quite a few female amateur scientists, an amateur not being a reflection of the scientific rigors, of course, and the dedication, that's what they assumed all women were into, just little bits of knowing how to make flowers and grow them, things like that. Um, but she use that formal scientific education that she got by studying everything around her and made things accessible to women. And membership in scientific societies was strictly forbidden for women and they were reserved only for men. But Potter's scientific work was exceptional and she deliberately tried to penetrate the very institutions that dismissed women's scientific labor solely on the basis of gender. By her early 1920s, Potter had developed a keen interest in mycology and had begun producing incredibly beautiful drawings of fungi. She collected mushroom specimens herself and mounted them for very careful observation under a microscope. In the winter months, she frequented London's Natural History Museum to study their displays. But her interests went far beyond the mere aesthetics or symbolism of mushrooms. She was studious about the taxonomy, excuse me, taxonomy, onom, yeah, taxonomy. She taught herself the proper technique for art, uh, accurate botanical illustrations, and she worked tirelessly to get an introduction to the eminent mycologist Charles McIntosh. With his help and encouragement, she continued advancing her microscopic observations and they kindled her in her an intense fascination with how mushrooms reproduced, something that was very poorly understood at the time. Potter was not really too perturbed by the rejection. She channeled her genius, her creative energy in a different direction. Only five years later, the self-published first edition of The Tale of Peter Rabbit sold out before the next commercial edition was even printed. Potter became one of the most famous and successful children's book artists and writers of her time and soon of all time. That same fascination with nature that had fueled her scientific work now was appearing in a new guise of her stories. They were full of fantastical beings of fairy tales, but the realistic animals and the plants that were native to every woods in which she had collected her mushroom species were carefully rendered so you could see them. And that was something that she wanted to be able to uh, bring to the world. And because she earned good money, she was able to buy her house and live in it all by herself and not have anybody there to bug her. So she was able to make and do what she needed to do. Oops, sorry, that's right, it doesn't work. Okay, the next um, person that I want, woman that I want to talk to you about is this woman, Clementine Hunter. And so Clementine, these are some of the works that you see here. She was a self-taught artist. She had very little schooling and she began working at a very young age in the fields at Melrose Plantation in Nach <laughs> Natchitoches, which is, she pronounced it, Natchitoches, the oldest town in Louisiana. And that was established in 1714. By the 1930s, Hunter was a house servant and a cook to the Melrose Plantation's artist retreat. They turned this big, nice place into an artist retreat. And it's where she was able to finally get handle on the materials and could paint for herself. She painted obsessively from this time on and she created thousands of work painting right up to the day before she died 
at 101 years old. Here are some noted facts about Clementine. She lived and worked at the Melrose Plantation. It was built by and for free black people of 70, for 75 years. When the Melrose became a haven for artists and writers, Hunter gained access to materials. She painted on a variety of surfaces, including boards, window shades, uh, jugs, anything she could put her fingers on, she would paint. She, her signature evolved over time, and she started with a backward C overlapping an H. So her CH is what you can see on some of her works. And you can see right down here in this one called the wash in the center, that CH that's there. Um, <clears throat> So she took charge of her image and her success, and she mounted a pay to see exhibits at her home. So she was real smart about how she went about things because she saw what the men were doing to get their, their art seen and looked at. So she even charged people to take pictures with her who may have purchased her work. Um, she would sell this work for a modest price, and she even created the occasional self-portrait but her faux folk, you know, that is what she was calling things. Hunter forgeries are all over the place. Because so people saw how popular her work was, how uh, not real refined it is. So they were copying everything they could. And there were Hunter forgeries that circulated since 1970s. And it isn't until 2009 that the FBI finally cracked the case. The dead giveaway, what? put it out there for everybody is there was uh there was excuse me there was dirt worked into the work but they cracked the case because the dirt was not from the plantation where she worked and did her work so somebody used dirt from someplace else to grind in to make it look like it was a real clementine hunter only to find that it was a forgery because the work did not have the dirt from her area where she did her work and I thought that was actually pretty clever that they were able to figure that out. Let's see if I can get this to Okay. Okay, now, whoops, hello. I am sorry, this is not the fun way to do this. My next artist is Alma Thomas. And art was always a part of, Al of Thomas's life. Many assumed that Alma Thomas became an artist mainly, mainly in the later stages of her career after she retired from, as a high school art teacher in 1960. She taught art for 35 years and her most famous work was produced in the years after she retired from teaching and up until her death in 1978. She had always been working toward being a full-time artist. Alma Woodsy Thomas was born in Columbus, Georgia in 1891. Her family was a rare black one living in the city's middle class Rose Hill neighborhood. The family moved to Washington DC when she was 15. And this is where she was able to finally take art classes. She likened those classes to a sanctum saying they were just where I belonged and where I was at home. She was encouraged by the head of her Howard, uh, head, excuse me, head of Howard University where she went to, to school. Uh, it was their art department that they encouraged her to be an art major. So she changed her major from home economics to art. And she was the first woman to earn a degree in art from Howard University. She also had a solo show at the Whitney in the early 1970s. She was the first black woman to do so. Some feel, felt that the Whitney was just trying to make up, you know, for all the years they excluded uh, black women from their ovir. And so she was not liking the fact that they were looking at her as a tokenism. And so while she was there, she selected a few artists to mask a lack of progress behind the scenes. So she was able to show how things worked in real life. Her work has been a part of the major retrospectives of Black American art since the 1970s. She is sometimes considered a rediscovery, though she ne never truly went away. 
Thomas's work was purchased and hung in the White House dining room during the Obama era. Her work is the first artwork by an African-American woman to enter the White House collection. Okay. So we're gonna look at the next set of determined women artists. It's the 20th century. And we're gonna look at Leonora Carrington, Aliki Brandenburg and Christine Monroe. Let me tell you a little bit about these women. Okay, so the, whoops, hello. The 20th century. These are the innovations of the 20th century. It had the first global scale conflict across the continents and the oceans with World War I and World War II. Nationalism becomes a major political issue in the world during the 20th century. They acknowledged an international law that um, along with the right of nations to be self-determinating and the official decolonization in the mid-century that related to regional conflicts. The 20th century saw a major shift in the way that many people lived. Changes in politics, ideology, economics, social, cultural, science, technology, and medicine. The 20th century may have seen more technological and scientific progress than all the other centuries combined to that point. Scientific discoveries changed the foundational models of physical science, forcing scientists to realize that the universe was more complex than previously believed. They also dashed the hopes or fears at the end of the 19th century that the last few details of scientific knowledge were about to be filled in. Well, as we can see in the 21st century, we still have a lot more technology that's on the horizon and coming daily or almost hourly. It was a century that started with horses, simple automobiles and freighters, but ended with high-speed rail, cruise ships, global commercial air travel, and the space shuttle. Okay, so let's look at some of these women. Start with Leonora Carrington, and that is her there in the corner. Uh, Leonora, Leonora Carrington was born into an upper class Irish Catholic family. They also, as a family, kind of had a problem conforming with societal standards. Her father wanted something done one way and her mother wanted other things. So she ends up finding a refuge in art. And in 1936, she enrolled in a new art uh, school that was done in London. Carrington met surrealist Max Ernst in London in 19. 37, and lived with him in Southern France after he divorced his wife. Most critics dismissed women serialists, but Ernst encouraged Carrington and she exhibited with the serialists internationally. World War II put a real end to the serialism in Europe. Ernst was tempor temporarily imprisoned as an inter at an internment camp and Carrington flees to Spain. She was institutionalized at a psychiatric hospital, suffering from extreme emotional distress, and she and Ernst never returned or resumed their relationship. Carrington eventually married Mexican diplomat Renato Leduc to facilitate her flight in, from Europe. Following a period in New York where she was reunited with many expatriate surrealists, Carrington travels to Mexico with Leduc. In Mexico, Carrington finds a vibrant artistic community and remains in Mexico City for the rest of her life. Okay. Eventually, she divorces Leduc and marries a Hungarian photographer, Emmerich Welts, excuse me, Weitz. And she had two sons with that uh, man, and she was honored with her first one-woman exhibition at New York's, New York's Pierre Matisse Gallery in 1948. This was followed by a solo and a group exhibition shows around the world. She died in 2011, one of the last living links to the surrealistic mo movement. Okay. So as we move into the funkier, what I call the funkier uh, artist, I wanna introduce you to Aliki Brandenburg. 
and that is her in the upper right hand corner. She is a children's author and illustrator. She spent her early life learning to draw. She is of Greek, she is Greek American, and Aliki Leocorus Brandenburg was born in 1929 in Wildwood Crest, New Jersey. While her parents were on a beach vacation from Philadelphia where they lived, she started drawing during her preschool years and eventually graduated from the Philadelphia College of Art in 1951. Her first job after college was in a display department for J.C. Penney's. This was the store in New York City. She soon returns to Philadelphia as a freelance advertising and display artist because her talents were very good and they really liked what she could do. Um, she traveled throughout Europe, especially in Italy and Greece. And in 1956, she learned more about her Greek heritage and to further practice her artistic skills and talents. During her trip to find out more about her Greek ancestry, she met her future husband, Franz Brandenburg, and they settled down in Switzerland after they married in 1957, and together they had three children. Her first illustrated book was the story of William Tell. And it was a Swiss hero that was famed for shooting an apple off the top of his son's head. And it was published in 1960. Her family then moves back to New York City, which leads to many more book illustration jobs, including book covers for her husband's books or his writing. Aliki and her husband moved to London in 1977 where they continued writing children's books. With her broad spectrum of picture books and over a hundred publications as author, illustrator, or both, backed by her intricate time uh, consuming research on her subjects, Aliki remains popular among preschool and grade school readers for her work. And in 1991, she was honored with the Pennsylvania School Librarians Association Award which is a pretty good, uh, pretty nice award for her work. I'm gonna to move to a little more contemporary person. So we're starting to get into the later part of uh, our 20th century. And I want to introduce you to Christine Monroe. Now it's interesting too, and it's fun for me because, and why I pick some of these more recent artists is I am seeing this work all the time by students, not that they're doing uh, things, you know, copying it, but they're taking the style and the influences that these younger artists are now doing. People that are working through the internet, posting things online, doing book cover designs, all sorts of things that they are connecting with. And Chris Monroe herself has written and illustrated eight children's books, including the whole Mon Monkey with a Tool Belt series. And so that Chico Bonbon slide that's in the center there, that is Chico Bonbon is the little monkey. And so there are a whole bunch of monkey with a tool that you see up there in the upper center. Uh, that's what started a lot of things. So she, um, hey, the Netflix series now showcases her primate protagonist, Chico Bonbon. So it is a series that's on uh, internet regularly for children's viewing. She's written and illustrated books about the pair of sneaky sheep, a bike riding ladybug, and a dog who can walk on two legs. Not to include illustrations, she's, you know, she's not copying for other people, but she did graduate from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. She lives in and lived in the Twin Cities area from 1980 to 1998 before she returned to Duluth, Minnesota. She's been named best local cartoonist She's the recipient of the 2015 George Morrison Award for Excellence in Art. And in 2016, she won an Emmy Award for her animation artwork for Kevin Kling, Lost and Found. It's a documentary that was produced by TPT and her children's books are now, uh, yeah, her children's books are now in five languages and have won over a dozen international awards. In 2017, she was inducted into the Duluth East High School Hall of Fame. So even in your hometown, you can win awards that people think are pretty, uh, pretty good to see. Okay, so we're going to talk about 
the determined women artists in the 21st century. And I'm sorry, it looks like the slide cut off, but the women that we're gonna look at are Juhi Hyun, Tara Krebs, and Joelle Dubois. Okay, so the 21st century. Oh, it says the rise of a global economy, a third world consumerism that marks the beginning of the uh, century. We also see increased private and deepening global concern over terrorism after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the NATO interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq in the early 2000s, and the overthrow of several regimes during the Arab Spring in the early 2010s. These all lead to a mix of mixed outcomes in the Arab world, and it results in several civil wars and political instability. The greatest powers of the century are considered to be the United States, China, and they consider it now an emerging superpower, the UK, France, Russia, Germany, Japan, India, Brazil, and Italy. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic began to rapidly spread worldwide, killing over 6.9 million people around the globe and causing severe global economic disruption. That includes some of the largest global recession since the Great Depression. Due to the sudden proliferation of internet accessible mobile devices, such as smartphones, they become ubiquitous worldwide beginning in the 2010s. More than half of the world's population obtained access to the internet by 2018. Well, that's pretty interesting in terms of just where I think everybody is in things. Whoops, hello. So Juhi Yoon, and here are some of the pieces of her work. You can see very, very colorful work, lots and lots of things that I'm sure some of you have seen these types of illustrations because I see them all the time and I'm just not always looking at art stuff for students. I look at everything. They're in my morning feed. They're, they're just, they're everywhere. She is an assistant professor. Ju Hee Yoon is an illustrator as well as a printmaker. She contributes regularly to international publications such as the New York Times, in addition to working on picture books, posters, and other projects. Her original pieces have been exhibited in various galleries, um, po excuse me, <clears throat> various gallery shows across the globe. And her long list of clients include Nautilus Magazine, Le Monde, The Washington Post, The New Yorker, and The Boston Globe, to name a few. Yoon's work won the ADC or the Art Directors Club Young Guns 13 Award, and she's been recognized by American Illustration and communication arts, as well as a society of illustrators in New York and Louisiana. She takes <clears throat> her take on the James Thurber classic, The Tiger Who Would Be King, made the New York Times top 100 best children's illustration books of 2015. Juhi is an illustrator and designer with a focus on publishing, advertising, and editorial projects. Rather than sticking to one medium, she finds the best approach that fits each project, and much of her work is informed by her experience with traditional printmaking, and the fascination of this process leads her and led her to design posters and books in spot color, participating in artist residency, teaching, printmaking, workshops, along with experimenting with a risograph machine, which is a cool Japanese uh, piece that makes art in a non-traditional way. She currently teaches illustrate in the illustration department at the Rhode Island School of Design and client her clients include Apple, Bloomberg, Business Week, Boston Globe, Chobani, Chronicle Books, Mother Jones, NPR, StoryCorps, New Yorker, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal, among others. I just think her stuff is fun. Tara Krebs. Tara Krebs is a Canadian native born in 1985. Yeah, I had kids at that point too. 
Uh, she grew up in a small suburb called Thornhill, and it's just north of Toronto. She currently lives and works in Toronto, where she earned her undergraduate and graduate degrees from the Ontario College of Art and Design. Her artwork has been exhibited internationally, and she has also painted figures and stop motion puppets for television. Through her work, she skillfully constructs open-ended stories that challenge us to jumpstart our imaginations. She really puts things together in a very strange way. She allows us to piece together our own meanings from her odd pairings and they, to reach our own conclusions about what the illustration is about. Fantastical fairy tale-like imagery rekindles our childhood memories of stories read to us before bedtime and how transfixed we were with the illustrations which accompanied the tales. Some of these are a little strange looking, yet I know that a piranha with a lamp in front of it that grows mushrooms on its back would be something really strange for a kid to see and to be able to talk about why that might have happened. Her lush detailed brushwork of her paintings pulls us into her world in a mesmerizing fashion. It urges us to make sense of whatever is unfolding as a narrative before us. And in an era when accessing information is almost instantaneous and patience is a dying quality, Tara's imagery reminds us to slow down, engage our imaginations, take pleasure from our curiosity, and the fact that not all of life answer, life's answers come to us straight away. Although she works primarily in a variety of media, Tara is most known for oil and her acrylic pop surrealistic paintings. As her painting technique is very detailed, it can sometimes take weeks or even months to finish one piece. She enjoys creating visuals that are open to interpretation and challenge the viewer to use their imaginations. The images that you see here, many of them have secret parts. Uh, there are body parts of women all throughout many of these uh, images because this is what she feels is very important, that women get a good representation in the art world. And I think she does a pretty good job with some of the things that might make some people a little uncomfortable to look at. The next artist that I wanna look at is Joelle Dubois. And she is a precise observer of today's society. Her work tells a dual story. At once it's universal and personal. And then the artist's paintings are strongly influenced by personal memories and experiences and to penetrate the realms of femininity, fertility, loss, and sexuality. These are all symbolically inscribed in the images and are waiting to be decoded by the viewers. She is strongly inspired by non-Western art and cultures. The voyeuristic aspects of digitization through social media and explicit scenes from private sphere, strange situations and twists of life, they all add a peculiar, peculiar experience of being human in a general way. Her mostly female protagonists are of multi-ethnic origin and often contradict the common since standardization ideals of beauty aren't to be followed any longer. The depiction of the female form fascinates the painter. She longs to normalize the body to portray body positivity. Dubois, Dubois work is also skillfully, skillfully peppered with allusions to art history. Quotations from famous works painters, compositions, or styles, as well as iconic use of symbols are not uncommon to her. In addition, the artist is committed to, today, to today's zeitgeist. Pop cultural references permeate her oeuvre incessantly. Her work is critical. It's a critical view of a post-quarantine era. And I just think her stuff is really interesting and not certainly things that you might consider to be something that anybody and everybody would like and see. Thank you. I am going to stop my share and
answer any questions anyone might have. So are there any questions out there? I guess I'm just curious from all of the um, artists there are in the world, how did you, what was the process you used to decide who to present? It was really based on my students, honestly. Um, I am seeing so much of digital art and other kinds of art in very unusual ways. I mean, these, one of the things that the pandemic has done, at least at my college and what I see with my students is they're looking at anything and everything they can. They are trying very much to be part of what is now in the now. And it's, it's really interesting to see what they look at and how they're doing things. I have students that are doing uh, animation. They're doing their own little um, projects that build into bigger projects. They're really very interesting. And I just started seeing lots and lots of very colorful, uh, crazy looking art that has multiple meanings because there's so much imagery and uh, symbology worked into it. I thought, yeah, let's give this a chance. Let's give this a try because these are the artists of the future. They are the ones that will be, um, you know, the up and coming, the things that you're seeing. I'm not sure how many of you have played with the um, program out there called Canva. Uh, Canva um, is free and you can certainly pay for things. And Canva is a, here we go. Canva is, was, is, it's a, product that was developed by a um, indigenous woman from Australia. And this is available worldwide. You can use their art, which a lot of the later 21st century artists, I'm sure I've seen their art on Canva because there's a lot of stuff that looks very similar. And so I'm seeing students doing all sorts of things with this stuff. And I thought, well, why not look at these artists as well? So I just, I, and I found it fascinating. I, I can tell you I had hundreds of artists and choosing 10 was really difficult for me. I wanted to delve into every single one of these, find what the secret stories were behind everybody. And I just couldn't do that in the time I had and for the time I had to do this uh, presentation. So I'm glad you're all here. I hope I didn't offend anybody, but th these are the up and coming artists. These are the people that you see all over now in things that are online as well as uh, gaming, all sorts of stuff. So, you know, I am, I guess I'm influenced by my students in a lot of ways because I love the color. Um, you know, I'm the one with the purple hair here. And so I, I love color and I look and use color all the time. And so, you know, it's kind of tough looking at sketch work without color anymore. I do like it, I love it, but students, they also are not necessarily wanting to do everything with paper and pencil. They want to do the same kinds of things you can do with paper and pencil, but they want to do it digitally. And that's how they are doing lots and lots of things. There's a program out there that's like $9 called Procreate that works on tablets. That is just, it's, it's like, or it's similar to Photoshop, but it's something that you can, you know, do a number of things and, put it out there and everybody seems to like what you can see, do and draw. And so that's what I am seeing a lot of is that kind of influence into my students' work. The woman also that started Canva, she was named one of the Inc's top 50 businesses for, I think it was 2020. And she's native, new, you know, from the, uh, I think she may be New Zealand rather than Australia, but she's she's down in the Southern hemisphere and she is, I am seeing everybody use Canva for a number of things. I had a presentation shown earlier today that was created in Canva. So they have the PowerPoint-esque way of doing things. So it's just, if you have not checked it out, do. You'll get lost for hours and probably have fun doing it. Did that answer your question? Is yes. it Canvas, C-A-N-V-A-S? No, C-A-N-V-A. V-A, no S, just Canva. 
and there's parts that you can pay for and there's parts that are free. And if you are an educator with another school or doing something in an educational role, you may have uh, an ability to get into it with uh, more, accept more options and opportunities available to you. So double check it. Um, I know that MCC has, a con you know, we're on the list. So there's a number of people using it as well as students. So it's, it's pretty incredible what you can do with it. Oh, can I, I ask question? another question? Sure. So this has to do more with a female artist. So we know one his, art historian who says you'd be hard pressed to walk down a street in America and have people name five female artists. Do you yeah. think that that will be changing soon? I sure hope it does. I think it's abysmal that we can't see things. I mean, just think about all the men that get things. I mean, many of the women in the early part of this lecture, they were muses to men. And they were there in a way that were used by men unless they had a backbone and stood up to it. You know, Beatrix Potter, she never wanted to be married. She didn't want to give away anything that she had worked really hard. She had a hard enough time getting accepted into a society that thought she shouldn't be there. So, you know, and she, because she called herself a scientist, even though the world didn't call her a scientist, she, the work that you can see, the um, her fungi work, oh my God, it's just gorgeous and detailed and really trying to show a thing in the world in its truest form. I can't fault that. I mean, she did a good job and she earned money and she didn't have to take it from, you know, she didn't have to do anything with men around because she found that it wasn't something that she could get real good help from. But that's, these are, these are my opinions too. These are my thoughts. You know, I was an art student. My, my art was photography. So I've been through the mill. I know all the stuff that, you know, a lot of these people do. I've done this whole thing in terms of art history. We all study. And my God, every art history at the time I was studying, which was quite a few years ago, were men of everything. So anyway, I hope that we have more people that we can say, hey, did you know that so-and-so did that? Or so-and-so did that. And that goes for artists of color as well. We have one of the most beautiful, in my mind, uh, hospitals in our community that was designed by an African-American man. And yet, does anybody know where that hospital is? And it's not one where they treat patients the way that you would think a hospital would. It's the Monroe Community, Co community Hospital there by um, 15, 15A, right in that area between, yeah, between 15 and 15A, right in that area where West, Westfall is. So that whole area there was designed by man of color. And can I ask one more question? Absolutely, I'm here for as long as you need. I guess it is almost seven, but I, I'm here. What advice would you have for a young student who would like to grow up to be an artist? Draw, 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 just draw. Look at art, study art, practice art, just do it and keep doing it. Because what I find is even in the graphic arts where I teach, you know, they, we use computers all the time and you can still do things by hand and you still can bring them in to look like, you know, they are useful in a technological digital age. And there are things now that you can draw with digital things that look like you used a pencil and paper. So it's all in the matter of how you go about things. I would say be a sponge. That's one of the best things you can do. Try things, look at things. If somebody gives you an opportunity to try something, do it. You know, I just, I can't say you can't. To me, you can study and look at art, go to museums, go to, you know, places that, go over to things like, um, what's the place over there? Oh, I can't think of it. It's a, it's got a bowling alley. It's got a, gaming it's got a restaurant uh it's off of atlantic avenue area i can't think of it uh 
I've been there, but I just can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head. It's it's a restaurant whole area that you can go as a family. You can get things and play games all over the place. You can have food. You can do whatever you want there. And it's pretty cool um, as a facility. But go see different things. Go try things. Go to the... Um, you know, the Eastman House, go play outside, go to the Strong Museum when it opens back up shortly. That is going to be the best place in town for quite a while. Uh, if you haven't seen what's happening over there, they are to be opening, I think, next week, I think is the grand opening. In the next couple of weeks, it will be reopening and they have put in uh, hotel areas right around that area they have made it family friendly and a whole art community in that area all around the strong museum and the playgrounds so they are they know where their um, population is coming and what they're doing and they've made it more accessible and i would just say go spend every hour you can doing stuff at museums there's some really great places to go so anybody else have questions Hi, Millie, I see you. I have one of my students here. So, and I have, <laughs> I have a colleague too. So, very cool. If there are no more questions, I would say this would be done. I would love to have. Quick question. Um, sure. Some of, the, some of the people here that are very famous um, seem to have published. Is that a link, um, would you say, to. Like Alethea, I mean, you know, in every school, of course, you know, she was popular and anyone that, you know, Beatrice Potter, but I'm saying like now currently, it's either being um, published in a magazine or a book or. Yeah. If, if is, that the, is that the link? That could be. Um, a lot of it is just turning over stones, just looking at everything and anything. And you hear somebody say something about, oh, that could be a book cover or that could be a whatever. Say well, who would I talk to about that? You know, just ask the questions because there are people out there all over the place that are publishing. And publishers, you know, it's publishing is a little different these days because you don't always need the big publishing houses. They help a lot because they've got a, a network that they can tap, tap into. But, you know, you are if you're on social media, or have social media that you do, you gotta be careful with some things because there are people out there that just rip you off. But in terms of looking for places, you know, anytime you hear anything about a publishing, whatever, someone's name, take it down, call them, ask them, you know, publish yourself. Some people are doing that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things out there. It's not necessarily something that you have to spend a lot of money on or a lot of time, but if you just keep looking and keep asking and keep applying, yeah, not bad. Does that answer your question? Yes, um, and also there's a tremendous interest now in outsider art and you had, I forgot the lady's name um, that did the outsider's art. The um, uh, Hunt, uh, Clementine. Yes, yes. yes. There's a tremendous interest in that. I mean, the armories here in New York City have, you know, <laughs> incredible shows and they charge an arm and a leg to even just get in to see it. You know, and that armory has been doing shows for over a hundred years because I remember photographers, when photography came as an art form, there was a major show at the armory. And if you were exhibiting there, you were, you were golden for a while because just about anybody and anything that was there got picked up and, you know, it was the new the new look for the time. So, you know, we get Georgia O'Keefe and we get Stieglitz and we get a bunch of those old people that are no longer with us, but their work is out there and you know it, to young people or people that were working under them. So, you know, today there's a lot of artists that also mentor younger artists too. So, you know, every scholastic book thing you see or every scholastic art thing you see in the local high school or grade school, you know, just keep looking at those things because you'll see stuff and you'll see things that are influenced by others, may come from art history, you may not know how or why, but they're, they're out there. And 
you know, there are, I have a number of students that were art winners in the Scholastic Art Awards in their schools whenever it was that they were back in school. And, you know, this is the way it starts for students and they get that sort of pride of being somebody that's been picked out and looked at and awarded something. So, you know, there's people like to do this to share with others. They like to do it just to get something ahead for themselves. They like to do it just because they like creating something. So it's just it's just about anything and everything that can be out there. Anything else? Well, thank you all. I really appreciated having you here. Uh, what I didn't show you were the three slides that had all the uh, URLs and all the credits for all the work that was that you saw in here. So, yes, I did credit it at the end. I didn't show you. All right, Don, are you still here? All right, I, I, Millie, go ahead. I'm not sure if my microphone's working. Well, I hear you. Or I um, did. I thank you very much. I really enjoyed the presentation. It was very informative. Thanks. Well, thanks and, for coming. Yeah. And I, I like the new I, picture. Yeah. I don't think I have any questions, but okay. I do think I'm going to look into Beatrix Potter because I'm yes. kind of interested in that stuff. Yeah, she was a pretty smart woman, you know, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. So I'm glad that she succeeded the way she did. Yeah. We'll see you next week. In, no, not next week in class. We're done. <laughs> yeah. All right. Did you include yeah. your email in case we had any um, questions or anything? I would be happy to put it here. Is this the type of um, presentation you do in your class or is it? I do in my history of graphic design class. Um, I do similar kinds of things in my own classes, depending on the subject matter. So when I get into graphic design one, we start looking at branding and we start looking at corporate, the corporate things, you know, what do you need as a business besides letterhead, business card and envelope, you know, so we start looking at those things and, and work on those. Yeah. I show them examples of art and design all the time. So for me, I learn best by seeing. So I am a visual learner. And that came really home to me through the COVID pandemic because all of a sudden it real I realized, oh, no, we can't just put words on the screen. We got to do a little bit more to keep people's attention. So anyway, yeah. I did you, did you see the email down there in the chat? I do. We see your email, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And Don said that he can close up the, the program. Great, okay. Well, thank you very much all. I appreciate the attendance and the audience. So stick around. I've got another idea for next fall. We'll see if that, if the library wants to do that one, so. Great, thank you so much, wonderful. Thank you. Yes, I love the uh, interest in Hilma Flint too, yes. Oh, there's just so much stuff that's coming out now that they're discovering, which I would say it's about damn time. But to quote Lizzo. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Night all. Thank you. Bye. Night all. Bye-bye.